First Peter is going to instruct us into how to build a life that thrives during suffering and doesn't just survive. The, to build a life that people would look at in the midst of suffering and ask a question of, man, what is going on with them that allows them to thrive this way in suffering and not look like everyone else's thing? City Bridge, we are so glad that you guys are here. Hey, thanks guys. Y'all are awesome. I love y'all. Uh, man, is there a better place to be on a Sunday morning? Yeah, I submit there's not. Even regardless of how dreary and droopy and wet it is outside, it is great to be here and it is my joy to be able to be here with you guys. If I haven't gotten to meet you, my name is Daniel Smith and I am the student ministry director and family ministry director here at City Bridge and I love serving with students and families here. It is so much fun. If you haven't gotten plugged in, I would love to help you get plugged in um, and love to talk to you about what that means and how we're on mission here together. We're going to jump into 1 Peter 3 today. Before we do any of that, it would help my heart. Hopefully it would help your heart if we spent some time praying. Is it okay with you guys if we do that? We good? Okay, great. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you because you're good and we can trust you. And so Lord, we just trust you with this time. Would you help us as we dive into 1 Peter 3? Would you open your word to us? Would you open our ears to hear your truth? Would you open our minds to understand your truth? Would you soften our hearts to be changed by your truth? Lord, reign and rule in this time. Use it for your glory, for your name. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, guys, uh, man, it is fun to be up here. I don't normally bring toys on stage, uh, but I did today. And just so you kind of have an idea of what this is, my youngest son, Micah, turned eight last Sunday, and he is really, really into Legos. <laughs> yeah, there we go. A lot of Lego disciples over here. Uh, and what that means is that at our home, we have Lego landmines everywhere. Walk around barefoot at your own risk. You know what I'm saying? If you stepped on a Lego with a barefoot, you know what it means to suffer. And so we're going to talk about suffering today. Uh, no, he actually, he got this for his birthday. Uh, and he jumped in and he spent, I mean, I, I want to say it was maybe like two, three hours building this. This is made out of Legos. I was really impressed when he was done. I was like, that's crazy. Uh, and for my students who have PTSD from other student ministry things, I am not going to break this. Uh, I know that I've done that in the past. I've talked about something being family and all that kind of stuff, and then I broke it. Uh, that's not happening. You can rest assured we're not going to break this. Uh, but what it did do for me was... Just like anything else that you see that's amazing, uh, anything else that you stand in awe of, you're like, man, I want to see if I can try and replicate this. This is so cool. I was really proud of him. I was really proud of all the time that he spent on it. And so I was like, man, I, I don't have all the blocks and all that kind of stuff, but I do have some time. I am going to replicate. Oh, no, it broke in my pocket. I'm going to replicate what my son made. And so I made a chance. I, I, I attempted to make an astronaut also. And, uh, and this, is, this is what I got. So thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, not going to lie, that took me an hour. <laughs> it was like, it's pretty tough. Uh, and it's like finding all the pieces, all those different things. Here's what's crazy, right? I was like, I'm a 42-year-old man. I for sure can make an astronaut. Um, but my astronaut is nowhere near as impressive as my son's. And, and I was like, this is crazy. Why was his so much better than mine? And I do think that what we're going to look at in 1 Peter leans itself to this. First Peter is going to instruct us into how to build a life that thrives during suffering and doesn't just survive. The, to build a life that people would look at in the midst of suffering and ask a question of, man, what is going on with them that allows them to thrive this way in suffering and not look like everyone else's thing? You see what I'm saying? And so I was considering this and I was like, man, the thing that my son did that allowed him to build such a really cool Lego model was one, when he got stuck, he asked for help. 
when he had two pieces that didn't fit together that weren't supposed to get together and he couldn't get them apart, he came to me or my wife to ask them to take them apart and help him get unstuck. He followed the instructions, trusting that it would lead to the finished product. And when he got confused, he looked at the example that was on the box to see what he was supposed to be building and what he was supposed to look like. And I would tell you, when we walk through 1 Peter 3, he's going to give us those same instructions. He's going to tell us that we need to build with each other. He's going to tell us we need to build with hope that following the instructions will yield the result that we're looking for. And he's going to tell us that we need to build off the example of Christ or build with Christ as our example. Does that make sense? You guys with me on this? And so if you haven't opened up to 1 Peter 3, here's your second chance. Open up to 1 Peter 3 in your Bibles or scroll to it in your phone or wherever you want to go. We're going to jump into 1 Peter 3 and see how Peter instructs us to build a life that thrives during suffering. And so 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, here we go. Finally, okay, so we're going to stop here right? <laughs> like, we're not going to do this the entire time, but we are going to start and stop. When he says finally, what he's actually doing is he's saying, hey, you need to consider what came ahead of this. If we're saying finally, we're referencing whatever was in front of this. It's the same thing that if you're reading your Bibles and you read a therefore, you have to go see what it's there for, if you go, if you, or any of that kind of stuff. So as we read finally, we have to keep in mind, and this is kind of where reading this in chunks does us a disservice. This is a letter. It was read all at once. And so you heard finally, you knew exactly what he was referencing. He was referencing chapter one, where he talks about building our life on the hope of Christ. And our new identity is set in that hope. He was talking about chapter two, where we were to reflect Christ, where we are cornerstones. And he's talking about the end of chapter two, where he's saying, you are to submit yourself to all these different authorities, to your governmental authority, to your boss, to your spouse, to Christ. And in this submission, we are going to put ourselves at risk because you know what? Our governmental authority doesn't like us, and in fact is lighting the roads with our bodies as he persecutes us, and we're going to submit to him. And Peter says, hey, finally, with that in mind, read this next thing. With that in mind, consider what I'm about to instruct you in. With all of that in mind, it should inform what you're about to hear from me now. And so finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, Brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. And what he's telling them is this. Be united. Build with each other. If you consider what you're going to have to submit to, if you consider what you're going to have to go through, you can't do this alone. Be kind to one another. Support one another. In humility, serve one another. And show love to each other. He tells us you can't do this alone. If we're going to go through the persecution that we're about to go through, you have to have other people to build with. In the same way that when Micah would get stuck and he would ask for help, it's the same for us. When we get into a situation, when we get into suffering, when we get into a place where we feel stuck, if we try to do it ourselves, we end up with something small and fragile. But if we build together, we end up with something that the world looks in at wonder. Does that make sense? You guys with me on this? Okay, so then he says, finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For this you were called to that or for this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. And then what he's saying is this. Okay, so finally, understanding all the things that we've asked you to submit to and all the ways that these people will probably take advantage of you because they don't share the same faith that you share and you're a minority in this area and so we can like, use our power to make you do what we want you to do. He says, be united and don't lash out. Be united and don't return their wickedness with wickedness. Be united and bless. And for us, we don't live under a, a government that's going to strap us to a pole and set us on fire so they can light their streets. Like that's, not, that's just not where we are. But I think the turnaround there is maybe you have a boss that treats you poorly. Or maybe you're a student at school and that science teacher just doesn't like you. 
That coach doesn't like you, so you don't get playing time. That science teacher doesn't like you, so you get more assignments. That boss doesn't like you, so he overlooks you for promotions. He doesn't promote you in the way that you should. Your coworker doesn't like you, so they speak poorly about you in the office so that other people start to ostracize you and so that you get overlooked for raises, for promotions, for projects, for other opportunities. And all of these people are working against you. And what would be the most easy thing in the world for us to do? To go over by the water cooler and complain about them. Tell me you haven't done that. Tell me you haven't had somebody that you thought was taking advantage of you. And the moment that you got time alone with someone else, you said, can you believe Joe? Uh, If your name's Joe in here, I wasn't using you on purpose. (laughs) Right? Can you believe what Joe did? Can you believe how Joe did this thing? The easiest place for us as people to connect is through complaining. Don't believe me? Go to a restaurant this afternoon. When your waiter serves you your meal, complain about the weather. See what happens. And what he's telling us is this. In the places that seem easiest to complain, even maybe where you feel most validated to complain, even maybe where you feel the most grounds to say this person is wicked, bless them. That's crazy. Think about it for the way they heard it. Nero, your ruler, your authority, the person who I told you to submit to, who's killing you, putting you in prison, putting you in the Colosseum, strapping you to poles on the streets, bless him. That's wild. If they can do that then, how much more so should we be a people of blessing now? If they could consider the people who persecute them then, how much more so could we consider a coach that we think has it out to get us to bless them now? How much more could we consider a boss that we think might take advantage of us to bless them now? Or a coworker, or a neighbor, or that mom on the PTA, right? because you were called to be a blessing. And here's the deal. Not only do we have times where we feel like our authorities might be the ones who are taking advantage of us and our authorities are the ones that might be making us suffer, there, I know that there are people in this room who have looked around and said, hey, if these are the people that I'm supposed to be building with, I feel like I've been hurt and I've been suffering by people who are on the same team. People who would say they're a believer And it feels like they are the ones who are hurting me. It feels like they're the ones who are taking advantage of me. It feels like they're the ones who are causing me to suffer. And like, that pain is hard when you felt like this person was supposed to be part of your team and now it feels like they're acting like your enemy. And and I'm sorry. And sinful people do crazy things. But you're not alone in it. Right, like he writes here, and if you've noticed in verse 10, it kind of indents the, the, the words a little bit differently. It's because he's quoting the Old Testament. And the Old Testament says this, whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Do you know who wrote this? This was Psalm 34. It's coming out of Psalm 34. So this is where we're going to interact with one another. Little pop quiz. Who do you think wrote Psalm 34? Yeah, man, you guys are so smart. You're smart and you're attractive. This is a great place to be. Uh, Yeah, David. David wrote Psalm 34. David was the author. And you think about it, and you're like, well, yeah, King David, that makes sense. He's got a lot of things going on. He wants, to have, he wants to pursue peace. He wants to be a good king. He wants to be a just king. But here's the thing. David wrote this when he was hiding in Abimelech's territory. Abimelech was an enemy of Israel. He was hiding because the king who was supposed to protect him, Saul, was trying to kill him. Now read his words. Whoever desires to love life and see good days... Let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. The amount of times that David had a bad boss, and by bad, threw a spear at him. I don't think you've had that day at work, 
right? <laughs> had a bad boss and tried to kill him. And David had an opportunity to kill Saul and take the kingdom for himself. Said, I will not raise my hand against God's anointed. He refused to strike back against the authority that God put over him. Why does Peter include this here? Because his audience would know it. If anybody had an opportunity to speak evil or to do, do evil, to preserve their own life, it was David. But instead, he trusted the promise that God had given him, that he would be king. And he didn't go about it the wrong way. He waited for God's timing. And in trusting God's promises, God proved he could be trusted. And David eventually became king. He puts him here to tell the, the people that he's writing to, you can trust God to fulfill the promise. And if you try to do this alone, you forget the promise that God has given you. How often have we done this? How often have we gotten in a situation where we're by ourselves and we then trust our circumstances and not the promise that is coming to us? My sons have done this often. Whenever we talk about like going to a game or going to a thing or, going, or getting a present, they will continue to ask even after we've told them, yes, you're going. They will continue to ask even after we've shown them the tickets. They will continue to ask because in their insecurity and in their nervousness of their situation, they forget the promise that we've given them. How much more so is that for us, for believers? You get into a situation like this, and you start to trust your circumstance and not what God has promised you. And so then he moves into his next section. In the same way that my son trusted the instructions with the hope that it would turn out the way that it was being built, he asked us to build with hope in our current situation. Look at it here. It says, now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? So most of us would read that question and it'd be like a rhetorical, well, no one. No one should harm you if you do what's good. If you're a high school student, you know that's not true, right? Like if you do what's good in high school or junior high, people come for your net. Like it's just the way it is. And I like, side note, the group of people in this room that are living more closely to the context that Peter is writing to are our high school and junior high students. Pray for them. You don't understand the amount of peer pressure that they face if they do the right thing. I had the privilege of being able to lead a small group and when I was talking to one of the guys in my small group around his senior year, I asked him, hey, do you think we have an idea of the kind of pressure that you face as a student? He said, no. Just look me dead in the eyes, no. I was like, wow, that was quick. And, uh, and he said, look, if you ask me in sixth grade to do what the Bible says all the way through my high school senior year, you're asking me to eat lunch alone for six years because nobody else is doing this. If I don't have a small group of people that I can go back to, again, going back to the whole build together, then that isolation becomes overwhelming. You probably don't face that in your job, but our students do. So pray for them. And here, he's saying, look, who would harm you if you do what's good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. In other words, whether you are getting, per, are getting persecuted or suffering because you're doing the right thing or whether you're not, you still do the right thing. You still follow the instructions. It will still build a life that other people look, to, look at and wonder because how easy is it for us when we start to experience pressure for doing the right thing to then shift and do the wrong thing just to be accepted? He comes into it and finishes it out by saying, have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ, as, Christ the Lord as holy. And this makes the whole difference in, the, in all of it. I am going to obey, I'm going to live righteously if Christ is my Lord. If Christ is my homeboy, it becomes an option. But if Christ is my Lord, then what he says goes. And that's what I do. And I would just ask you, is that what you're doing? 
Have you trusted Christ to save you from hell? Or have you made him the Lord of your life because you trust him, the one who died for you, the one who rose, and the one who's coming again? Which one have you done? And so then he says, have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason or a reason for the hope that is in you. And I would just tell you, if Christ is your Lord, then you have a hope that sustains all suffering or anything else that you might incur. If Christ is your Lord, then you have hope that points to eternity, not to your circumstance. And as they read this, if we're reading it as a letter, they would have known 1 Peter 1 and 1 Peter 2. And they would have gone back to 1 Peter 1 that says your hope, the new identity of hope that you've been born into is the one that is in Christ came and lived a perfect life. Christ died your death. Christ rose from the grave and Christ is coming again. And that hope sustains any circumstance because when he comes, he makes it right. And this hope is the hope that endures suffering for doing what is good. Because we don't have to be concerned about what is good to us right now. Good is coming for us. Does that, make, does that make sense? And so then he says, always be prepared to give, a, to give a defense for anyone who asks you the reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. And we all have been that person, right? Somebody is asking you, what's the reason for the hope that you have? And you're like, you don't have hope. And you're like, well, now I don't think you have gentleness or hope. And I don't want to talk to you. And it's one of those things where it's like, man, you, you have gone to somebody with a positive thing and they've responded in a really like kind of condemning way. And now you're kind of like, I, I'm done. You know, like, I don't want to have this conversation anymore. And I had the privilege of being able to um, kind of navigate this situation with my son. I was really proud of him. He came home from school one day and he told me I got in trouble. And that may seem odd, but I, I asked him like, hey, what, what happened? And he said, well, I was sharing the gospel with one of my friends and my teacher pulled me aside and got me in trouble for it. And I said, buddy, I'm so proud of you. If you get suspended for sharing the gospel at school, we're getting ice cream, right? Like that's, that's how this is going down. I don't care, right? Like this is, I, I'm so proud of you. And then I, just out of curiosity, I was like, man, Noah, I'm so proud of you. That was such a good thing for you to do. Hey, how did that conversation go down? And he said, well, I walked up to my friend and I looked at him and I said, do you know you serve a false god? It's, like, hmm. it's not really the gentleness or the respect that we're talking about here, but, uh, but he did it because he had hope. And we talked around like, hey, you know, like let's, let's share in a way that people can hear and all that kind of stuff. And, and eventually, one day I come home and I hear him playing with one of his friends back in his room. And I kind of walk back there just to check on what's going on. As I'm walking back there, I'm hearing them pray. I'm like, what is this? And not only am I hearing them pray, I'm hearing him lead this other kid in a prayer to trust Christ. And as this kid trusts Christ, this kid starts coming to this church. Because the friends on the block, right, doing this together and doing this with hope, have been sharing with him. And now his whole family comes here. And it's incredible. And so those same kids... I'm, I'm driving home with Noah, and I'm asking him, hey, can I share these stories with you? And he goes, yeah. And then he tells me, actually, these same kids were at school, him and his buddy Jones and his buddy Josh were at school, and they were sharing the gospel with somebody, and another kid came up to them and said, hey, we can't do that here. You're going to get in trouble. And they said, we don't care. This is the hope that endures. They didn't say that part, because they're nine. But... <laughs> <laughs> they, they did say, like, we don't care. Like, this, this, me this message, this hope matters. It doesn't matter what happens because I share it. What matters is that it's shared. And I would just ask you, if people looked at you in your moments of, let's, like, let's be real, we're, not, we're not, probably not having immense suffering. We're probably having a lot of stress. If somebody were to come up to you and they were to follow you in your moment of stress, where would they see your hope is? Would they see in your moments of stress and suffering that you run to prayer, that you run to God's word, that you run to God's people? Or in your moments of stress and suffering, would they see that you run to an extra dessert? 
that you run to a few more hours of Netflix just to numb out and escape. That you run to that extra glass of bourbon or that extra cigar to medicate and try and relieve the stress and the suffering that you feel. If our hope is in the fact that Christ came, Christ died, Christ rose, and he's coming again, our hope is in him and nothing else. And I say this from personal experience. I'm 42 years old, but I like to live like I'm 21. That has created two surgeries for me this year. Uh, And as I've gone through this, the thing that I've found is that I like to run to Ben and Jerry's Tonight Dough. I love a pint of heavy cream and a lot of sugar. And I feel empty every time. And it's taken me to a place that I don't want to go that I'm trying to go come back from. And I would just implore you, where you go to to find hope that's not Christ, repent. Repent. It's going to take you where you don't want to go. And you're not going to experience the beauty of building a life of hope in him. And so he says, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. Here's the thing. Suffering's coming whether you want it or not. You might as well suffer for doing good than doing evil. If you while out and you make a bad choice and you hurt friendships, the suffering that you incur is on your head. If you decide you're not satisfied and you go have an affair, that suffering, that's not you suffering for God's glory. That's you suffering for you. And it's not worth it. But suffering for doing good, he says, is better and will reap an eternal reward. And it imitates Christ. We build with Christ as our example. We build a life that thrives in suffering when we build with Christ as our example. Just like Micah had a box to go off of to see what this was supposed to look like. Christ came, lived, died, and raised again so that we might have a life to model, to, to model ours after, a life to mirror. And this is what he said, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh and made alive in the spirit. Christ is our example. Christ lived a perfect life. He did all the good things and they killed him for it. So that we might be able to be brought to God. The blessing that comes is union with God, not relief of your circumstance. The blessing that comes is knowing him and letting him give you life, not grabbing for one of our vices to try and give it, trying to have an inanimate object give us life. Does that make sense? You guys with me on this? All right, now is where, Paul, where Peter gets weird. So, 1 Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 19. So remember, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were being brought safely through the water. What? Like, Peter, we were going so good. I was tracking with you. What does this mean? Uh, and if you're like me, like I, you're reading this and you're scratching your head. And you're like, did, did this mean this or this mean, like I have so many questions. Well, I got a little bit of extra time to research a little bit of what this meant. And so really what you have is you have two kind of options here. Two of the most like uh, well-considered theories around what this means are this. The first, uh, and we're going to put them up here on the screen. There we go. And if you want to take a picture of that, great. If you don't, great. This doesn't change your salvation. All this does is maybe stir your affection for God and what he put in, your, in the word. Does that make sense? All right, so here we go. The first option is this. Christ preached through Noah to his generation, right? If you go back into the flood account, Noah was the only righteous man. Everybody else was wiling out. And God said, hey, I'm gonna start over. Noah, I'm gonna start over with you and with your family. And if anybody repents and wants to get on the boat, you can let them on the boat, but they have to repent. And so this would be Christ's 
was like using Noah as his representation to a generation of people that were living a rebellious life. Christ preached the message of repentance through his messenger Noah in hopes that they might be saved. And kind of the, the, the idea behind this is that, man, God has for always used his people as his messengers. And kind of fits in with the narrative of what he calls us to do, to be his messengers to, hit, to people in this area for repentance and salvation. The other theory is this. Christ proclaimed victory over fallen angels. As I studied, I would have been in camp proclaiming through Noah, but as I read more, I found myself coming to this one because it seems to make more sense in the text. And it's crazy. Apparently in Genesis 6, not apparently, in Genesis 6, there were fallen angels who rebelled during the time of Noah. Those angels were trying to, like, thwart God's plan. And in that, God imprisoned them in a special place. And through Christ, what he's doing is after his resurrection from the dead, he's going to them and he's telling them, what you tried to subvert, I have achieved. I have victory. You are mine. You submit to me. This seems to back up with the Greek words that are used for proclaim. Like proclaim is not, hey, go preach the gospel. Proclaim here is like, hey, I'm going to a land. I'm claiming victory over the land, and this land is now mine. The word that it uses for spirits is not what it would use for human souls, but it would use for more commonly for angels. And it seems to match up with the rest of the text, where it says this. Because they did not formally obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah. While the ark was being prepared, in which few, that is eight persons, were being brought safely through the water, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience, through, resurrection, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone to heaven and is at the right hand of God with the angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. We end with Christ's victory over anything that could cause us suffering. He claims his. He says, you submit to me. He says, it's all mine. And what that means for us is this. Because of Christ's victory, our suffering is not meaningless. Because of Christ's victory, the things that we might submit to will ultimately submit to him. Because of Christ's victory, we have hope. And it's not anything that we have done. It's not anything that you could accomplish. It's not anything that you could muster up. It's not any resume that you could put together. But it is Christ's death burial and resurrection that has claimed the victory and he's going to come back to claim it all one day. So our suffering doesn't and isn't meaningless. But it will proclaim his goodness, his glory, and one day will be made right with his presence. And that's something that we can rest in. And that's something that we can trust. And that's something that as you go through hard times, you have to grab onto. That's something that as your friends go through hard times, we have to remind them of. And that's why if you want a life that thrives in suffering, we have to build together. We have to build on the hope of his return. And we have to build with Christ as our example. What's unique about this text is that I personally feel like I've gotten to see this happen firsthand in this body. I don't often wear a graphic tee, uh, but today I am. If you've seen one of these t-shirts, if you've seen somebody wearing it, they've been a part of Luke and Erica Harrison's story. Luke Harrison was 31 years old is 31 years old. Sorry, wow, that was tough. Luke Harrison is 31 years old. Luke Harrison was diagnosed with an aggressive form of cancer, having two small children, one that had just recently gotten here. 
And as he was diagnosed, they started to realize that it was like systemic. It was over his whole body. And as they started to do more research, it made it got really, really scary. And if you've seen one of these shirts or one of, these, one of the people wearing these shirts, these have been the people who decided to build with the Harrisons. They sold these shirts to help raise funds for, to cover their medical costs. People who were wearing these shirts probably went over to the Harrison's house to play with the kids so that Erica could spend time with her husband at the hospital. The people wearing these shirts have probably delivered a meal, did a chore, met the Harrison's where they are. And the people who are wearing these shirts have built this with them together. I had the privilege with, my, with the students team to be able to go and visit Luke in the hospital. And I was preparing myself. Anybody who is going through something so tragic at such a young age with tiny people depending on him. Like I, I was prepared to walk into a room of brokenness. I was prepared to share tears with my friend. And I walked into a man who had a joy I couldn't explain. I saw him tell me about God, what God was teaching him. I saw him have faith that whatever happened, God was gonna work it out for his good. I saw him build with hope. I saw Erica do the same. And in any moment that they had, use it to point to the goodness of Christ as our example. They were built different because they were built on a hope that lasts. Because they were built on a hope of Christ's death, burial, resurrection, and return. I think for some of us, you might be sitting in this room going, I want that hope. I've never heard of this before. I've been to church a long time, but I didn't know that you could have that kind of hope. And I would just tell you, we're, we're going to sing, and in a minute we're going to have people down here. And if you want that hope, we, we want to we help you with that. We want to pray with you. We want to talk with you. But it only comes through trusting Christ as your Lord. It only comes trusting that he's coming again. And we know that we can trust his promises because he's good. Let me pray for us. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we love you, we praise you, we thank you because you're good and we can trust you. Lord, with our, with our pain, would you help us to trust you? With the moments that feel like they don't make sense, would you help us to trust you knowing that you're coming back to make them make sense? With the pain that we have that can glorify you, would you help us to trust you with it, knowing that you're good? God, would you meet us where we are, that we might honor you? It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.